I will not get knock me. I work for a Republican Attorney General, and I work for a Republican governor. But the key here is, you need to go to all your legislators. You need to elect Republican legislators who agree with your agenda. It doesn't do you any good if you elect any one of us four and you have a DFL legislature. It has to be a team. So think about the issues on which I am pro-life and support the Second Amendment, having had guns since I was 10 years old. So tonight, I will answer any questions here on the panel, obviously, and since my time is up, I will yield to my next speaker. Mr. Parrish, please. Thank you very much. Just so we don't get tangled up here. I'm Philip Parrish. Who, who's seen me speak before? All right, all right. We're going to get excited tonight. We're going to get loud and proud. I'm Philip Parrish. I was born and raised in southern Minnesota. I went to, I was actually born in Blue Earth. Where's Jim? I was born in Blue Earth. My dad was teaching at Frost, so we didn't live in Blue Earth, but born in Blue Earth, so I have to claim fame there. Went to school at Mankato State, then Mankato State, now Minnesota State, and I became a K-12 music teacher, and then I became a principal. In the midst of my 30 years as an educator and still licensed principal, I had joined the Navy Reserves as an intelligence specialist. And for nine and a half years, I was called to active duty a few times as an intelligence specialist enlisted. After that, I was offered a direct commission as an intelligence officer. And now this July will be 20 years serving you, serving our country. And in those experiences, as I specialize in counterterrorism and foreign policy, I've had some direct experiences that led back to Minnesota. And what's that got to do with the governor? Well, I've been exposed to uh, a list of things going on in Minnesota that our leaders to this day, many of which are aware of, They've stood there and done nothing for decades. Decades of no action, knowing about money laundering, human trafficking, child sex trafficking, and companies that are front companies to only exploit social services benefits to the tune of $734 million in 2016. These kinds of exploitations are harming our communities and citizens, okay? We need to get this conversation started. We can have this conversation in a dignified and meaningful way. And I'll do, look forward to doing that more. I'm Philip Parrish. Hey. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm Jeff Johnson. I know many of you, but for those of you who don't know me, a little background. I was born and raised in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. My wife, Sandy, is from Crookston. We went to college in Moorhead. So we're children of northwestern Minnesota, but we've been in Plymouth now for 20-some years. We have two teenage boys. Thor is in college. Rolf is in high school. I spent most of my adult life in the private sector. The last 17 years, I've been self-employed. And then I also served six years in the House during that time, and I'm now in my third and final term on the Hennepin County Board as the very lonely voice of Sandy in the heart of Minneapolis. And I'm running for governor for a really simple reason. To give you control over your own money, and over your own property, and over your own health insurance, and over your own kids' education, and frankly, over your own lives. We have seen an out-of-control trend the past, I would say, 20 years where government is taking too much, it's spending too much, and it's doing too much. And I'm looking forward to talking about a lot of specific issues, but I can boil it down to this. This is what will drive me as your governor. We are going to change the culture, the attitude in St. Paul and our agencies from that of telling everybody else how to live their lives to actually serving the people who pay their salaries. And if there's a government employee who can't get on board with that, they're not going to survive the Johnson administration. Whether they're in the DNR or the MPCA or the Department of Education or any other agency that doesn't understand their sole purpose to exist is to serve us, not to control us. So thank you all for being here tonight. I look forward to it. Well, thank you all for coming out this evening and being here. And Will, I don't know where you went, but thank you to you and your team for putting this on this evening. Um, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm Mary Giuliani Stevens, uh, running for governor, and I will abide by the endorsement. A little bit about me, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. I've lived most of my life here in the state. I'm one of six children in a Christian Italian medical family. So we had a good time down there in Rochester. Uh, married to my husband, Greg, wave Greg, for 33 years. 
two children, two grandchildren. I'm serving my eighth year as mayor of Woodbury, and I'm really proud of the track record. Since we only have 90 seconds, what I want to just point out is, if you haven't seen my 12 reasons why I'm a Republican, I'd ask you to pick one up in the back, take a look at it, or pick one up tomorrow. But I just want to say a couple of things. I believe in our Constitution, not someone else's. I'm pro-life, and I support the Second Amendment. I believe in our free enterprise system. I believe in limited government and fewer regulations. And I believe it's God, not government, that empowers people to make a difference in this world. Please pick one of these up. Thank you. All right, we'll start with our first question, and that will go to you, uh, Mr. Johnson. What is your stance on making work for welfare a requirement for receiving government assistance? My driver, my 36-year-old son, and I discussed this very question on the way down. So I got a good opportunity. Conceptually, I'm of the view that if you're able to work, you must work. Now, not everybody can work. There are people who are obviously totally incapable, whether it's for physical reasons, emotional reasons, or psychological reasons. Then we have to be careful what we do. But I will adhere to the principle that if you can work, and if I'm the governor, and you elect legislators who agree with that, you better start thinking about finding a job. I think that there's a time limit on that, a reasonable period of time, but I strongly and absolutely and unequivocally do believe that if you are reasonably capable of getting a job, you better get a job. And don't say to us, well, I can't find a job, because we'll give you a nickel and you can take the bus and start looking. I don't have any compassion. People say, well, you know, I can't find a job, I can't find a job, or if I do that, I can't do it. Can't is not a part of my vocabulary. Failure is not a part of my vocabulary. I always say, I can do it. And I expect you to do it also. If you did not find a job, don't say, I failed at finding a job. Say, I learned something applying for that job. I was not successful in applying for that job. And what I learned is I will change my method of applying for the next job, and I will be successful, so I'm able to wean myself from the welfare program, and the people who do pay their taxes annually have hard jobs, and have been here for many, many years, do not have to pay my way anymore. So, I want to be very, very clear. I am opposed to any type of welfare that does not require people to get a job if they are capable of working. Thank you very much. Mr. Parrish, you have the next one is actually a two-parter. What are your ideas for more effective ways to handle the management of agriculture water uh, diversion? And a follow-up question, do you believe that buffer strips are the solution? No, buffer strips are not the solution. It repeat it. Can you say the first part of that again? I'm sorry, but... What are your ideas for more effective ways to handle the management of agricultural water diversion? Right, so this is something my dad and I, my grandfather, uh, spoke about quite a bit when I was younger, and my, my dad obviously speaks to me frequently, and all of a sudden he's more interested again. <laughs> it's like he's gonna get some inside track there. Now, uh, my father and grandfather were very, uh, uh, very concerned about being very good stewards of the land. And one of the notions that I would like to suggest to all of us as farmers who grew up as farmers, one of the very interesting things about our tiling policies and our tiling infrastructure, isn't it interesting that all this buffer zone uh, garbage and false narratives completely avoids a different problem? And that's where direct flow into streams is actually the problem. But you never hear anybody talk about that. So I want you to start thinking about, do some research tonight, Start asking why nobody's talking about, talking about the tiling systems and direct flow into water streams. Just a thought for you tonight. I'm not going to try and dig into where you're thinking about it. Just you make your own decision. The buffer zones are complete ludicrous and false concept and false narratives for many different reasons because why we already had laws on the books and our farmers that own land in this state and actually care for the land are the best stewards of the land. The narrative of the Democrats is so ridiculous that you can debunk it in very quick and easy fashion. 
Why would any farmer want to hurt their own families and community? Why? It makes no sense. They don't, and they don't want to. And they can be the best stewards, and working with the farmers is the best way, and help getting out of them their way and letting them do their job is the best way to handle this. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. With the uh, current national focus on school safety, what are the suggestions for making our schools less accessible to those who would do harm to our students? Well, I think there's a lot of things you can do. Obviously, you can spend money to harden the perimeters. I think we should actually expand the safe schools levy that is already in place. I actually happen to believe that people who are licensed to use a gun ought to be able to have one to protect our children from people who would do them harm. But what bothers me about this whole gun debate, the Second Amendment debate, and I just put a, a piece out yesterday or, or today on this, is that the, just every time one of these horrible, horrific tragedies happen, and these are personal to me, I got two teenage boys. One of them's at a huge college, one of them's at a huge high school. That's, this, these are the places where these things happen. But I get so frustrated that every time one of these things comes up, we have a quote unquote national conversation, which isn't a conversation, it's one-sided, and the problem is always the Second Amendment to the people who are talking. And they come up with an easy answer for them. Let's restrict guns from law-abiding citizens in one way or another, as opposed to what is actually causing the problem. And the reason they won't talk about it is because it's really difficult and disturbing. Something has happened to some of the young men and boys in our society over the last 30 or 40 years. When I was growing up in Detroit Lakes, a lot of us had rifles in the back of our pickup trucks on school property. We'd bring them into the school sometimes to show them off. Nobody ever considered that somebody was going to shoot anybody else. Now the thought of that is just ludicrous because everyone's so concerned about it. Something has happened. And, and we got to start talking about that. It, it, it has to do with broken families. It has to do with the fact that our pop culture is drenched in violence right now. It has to do with mental health assessment. It has to do with this politically correct belief that schools can't discipline violent kids because it might affect one group over another. And until we're willing to talk about those things, we're never going to get to the bottom of this problem. Mayor Stevens, uh, what would you propose to attract new businesses to Minnesota while retaining existing businesses who see our high taxes and regulations as a barrier to their success? Well, we could start with getting government out of the way. <laughs> Minnesota is not a business-friendly environment. We need to change that culture. As mayor of Woodbury, we did let the free market work. And as a result, jobs have increased by 17%. In the last five years, over 320 new businesses have come to the community. But there's only so much you can do at a local level. When you look at Minnesota's economy, we're growing at what, 0.7%? The national economy is growing over twice that. We have to change our tax and regulatory environment if we're going to be business friendly. Right now, we're having trouble keeping our businesses, let alone attracting new ones. We want our businesses to stay here. We want them to know we value them. We want them to grow here. To do that, we start with tax reform. And to do, my goal is to get us out of the top 10 in all major tax categories. Right now, under Dayton administration, the taxes, by adding that fourth tier, has made taxes higher for everybody. And when you look at his new proposals, I understand that even those on the low end are going to be taxed more. We can't continue that way. We need to address the death tax. When they're looking at, at uh, reconciliation with the federal tax code now, Dayton wants to go backwards. He doesn't even want to bring it up to the three million it's supposed to be at, let alone reconcile with the federal tax code. That's got to change. We've got to... Our retirees, they want to work part-time. We tax them on their Social Security in Minnesota. We want to keep these valuable workers. Let's get rid of that tax. And our, thank you. And our regulatory burden, burdens have only grown in this state. We will never be a business-friendly state when we continue to pile on regulations. 
whether it's agriculture, small businesses, entrepreneurs, or any of the companies we have here. Thank you very much. Lance, this one is for you. What do you believe we can be can be done under our current state health care system to bring transparency and pricing to medical services and prescription drugs? Well, let me, let me part, start out with a part that I disagree with. I'm not so sure that everybody should have all of their prices posted. I don't think if you're going to have a medical procedure done at a particular hospital or by a particular surgeon, I don't think that uh, they should be required to post those, and here's why. I have an artificial ankle, and uh, that's a result of my right foot being off and reattached 50 years ago. And I went to three orthopedic surgeons until I found one who was, in my opinion, qualified to do this ankle replacement. I asked him how many he had done, because I didn't want to tell me he had only done one or two of them. He said, I've done 700 of them. That's quite a few. Now, if I had to go somewhere else and get an opinion or a price for someone who replaced ankles, that would not be competitive. What was important to me is this orthopedic surgeon who specialized and did only ankles, surprisingly, was the surgeon for me. So I'm not so sure that's a good idea to require you to go and get these. It might be like finding a lawyer who found his, his law license in a Cracker Jack box, you know? Not all of them are qualified to be practicing law. So I'm not totally sure I think that's the solution. However, we do need to have a system that we need to go back or we can have a system that allows people to have their own choice as to insurance. And I'm opposed to any extension of this tax where the health insurers are required to pay in the next year or two roughly $700 million. That's going backward. You have to have the right to go to your own surgeon, pick out the insurance company you want, and the people that provide your particular needs. But I don't think it's a good idea to do a requirement on surgeons and perhaps medical uh, procedures in other areas as well. All right, Mr. Pitch. Congress and President Trump's administration are considering changing Medicaid to block grants to the states. What would you do with those block grants to see that they are effectively spent? So like all of our programs in Minnesota, the social services programs and other programs that are managed by a large bureaucracy, one of our biggest challenges is fraud, waste, and abuse. And the bureaucracy itself taking on the bureaucracy itself taking on an overwhelming amount of staff and overhead that takes all those dollars away from the people that are, the money is intended for. So we need to reduce the bureaucracy, shrink the bureaucracy to the, so that those who actually are supposed to be getting the assistance, supposed to be getting in Medicare, Medicaid, are actually getting the money. Because we have to find a direct path and cut out the middleman because the middleman isn't providing any of those services. They might be managing it, but they're managing it poorly and it also then leads to this very large waste, fraud, and abuse problem where you don't have people with the courage and wherewithal to stand up and say, no, you don't qualify, or no, you're not a citizen, and you don't get Medicare because you're not a citizen. Mr. Johnson, would you be willing to evaluate idle public and government-owned land and offer it back for sale to the private sector where it can be maintained by private citizens and return to the tax rolls? That's kind of a loaded question, and yes, absolutely. I, I happen to believe that both the state and federal government have more than enough land, and uh, you know, I think having uh, state parks and national parks is a good thing, but um, it, it's gotten completely out of hand, especially in parts of greater Minnesota. So I would absolutely be willing to do that. And since that was a quick answer, I'm gonna jump back to actually the first question that was asked of Lance uh, regarding work for welfare. I talk about that all the time that I think it's extremely important that we start requiring that people who are able to work, the devil's sometimes in the details, but people who are able to work, work. Not as a punishment. Not because I have to work so he or she should have to work, but because work is intrinsically good. And it's one of the ways that we show that we were created in the image of God to share the gifts that he gave us with other people. And uh, it's also one of the only surefire ways, probably the only surefire way, to help people move out of poverty to self-sufficiency. And that's what we all want for our fellow Minnesotans, right? So that is going to be a central theme of my campaign, but I think it's important how we talk about it. So it doesn't come across as we want to punish people. 
but we actually want to help people. Mary, what policies, if any, should our school districts put in place for early recognition and intervention in children who have obvious emotional problems? I think that our school districts should look at local solutions, and some of those should be in those areas. When we, there was some discussion here on, um, on gun issues and school safety, and as we look at some of the underlying problems, I think that we need to have earlier detection and recognition um, for our children of mental health issues. So I support that at the local level in the schools for those programs for the identification of that. Um, with parent involvement in that. I think that's one of the underlying issues that we need to address. I also want to take some time to answer um, some of the other things that came up, and particularly I'm going to address the price transparency uh, because I have a little different uh, opinion on that one. I believe that, and I support price, price transparency. I announced my 15-person health advisory cabinet early in the year, and they're working on policy for me there. And price transparency is one of those issues. You can't purchase something you don't know what it costs. There's two pieces of legislation working their way through now that would say you have to post the top 25 procedures for primary care, and there's a separate bill, a pharma bill, working through it, its way through the legislature. I think they're a step in the right direction, but I think we need to go further. You know, you walk in a grocery store, and there's thousands of items. They change those prices all the time, and they don't have any trouble posting them. I think if we can figure it out in the grocery store, we can figure it out in healthcare. Lance, should the state contribute resources to encourage startups and small businesses of less than 50 employees? The answer is yes. You know, there was a little uh, rasping or buzzing in the PA system here a few minutes ago. I thought maybe uh, McCabe and Obama and Susan Rice and somebody had applied to uh, come in here and camp our lines for not getting the proper warrant. Isn't that a mess, most creeps? You know, a few uh, months ago, they were going to give uh, Amazon some incentives to come to this state. I was opposed to that. What I thought we should do is instead is do exactly what your question uh, queried about, and that is we have to provide incentives to people who have fewer employees, 50 employees, because it's more realistic that those people will start their own businesses and become successful. So yes, we should do that, and we need to probably give them some better tax treatment in the early years. If they do, then they're going to have to have that recaptured as they move along. But I'm a small business owner. I paid all my bills when it went well. I reaped the benefits when it went badly. There was only one person I could blame, and that was Lance Johnson. My wife, who is a psychologist and thinks she can fix everybody, you know how those psychologists are, but she also has her own small business. She pays her own bills. So our family believes in small businesses, and we have to pay the bills, and yes, in early years, I think it's appropriate to give some type of limited motivation to people who have the encourage and the desire to start their own business. Mr. Parrish, here's a health care question. If the opportunity presented itself at the federal level for Minnesota to withdraw from the ACA, would you support such a move? Absolutely, 100%. Would you like to use the time for anything else? Uh, go back to the gun safety, uh, or the gun uh, issues, the Second, the second Amendment. Um, in our schools, do you know what an air marshal does? How many of you have experienced an air marshal? Okay. So in my, in my belief, in my, this is really hard to manage the volume of the site. By the way, I, I, I'm not sure why, but. Can you hear me if I talk like this? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this thing is all right. So, in in our schools, if we had what, what we would consider an air marshal, that in that kind of manner, where you don't know who they are, you don't know, you just anonymous, you'd have no idea where they are in the building. Sure, kids are smart; they're going to figure it out. But eventually, it becomes a part of the school. And this whole notion, the gun-free zones, is a target. It's just a magnet for violence. 
And this is an idea that we can take on and we can win this discussion, we can win this debate over our, protecting our children and we need to do it. It's negligence to continue down this path of ignoring what's going on and how abusive, violent, vulgar people are controlling the narrative and it's got to stop. Johnson, what would you do to reduce the number of people and families from becoming perpetually dependent on state-funded welfare resources? There's a lot that we can do. One thing that I, I talk about very consistently is that we need to start auditing every single human service program we have in this state. It will take years, and so sometimes the Democrats say, well, it's going to take years, so why even start? But my belief is we should have something systematically in place that measures every one of these programs, not looking for fraud or waste, but looking, trying to figure out whether they actually work or not. Because we claim we're spending all this money, we are far out of step with similar states when it comes to welfare spending. And we claim it's because we care about people and we want to help them become self-sufficient. Then let's start measuring every program and demanding that they actually have to help people become self-sufficient. And stop spending the money that they don't. So I think that's an important part. But I, I'm going to go back to the work requirement again, because if, if, I think that is, is just so crucial and fundamental that we are constantly talking about the value of work, that we're removing from the system that we have every disincentive to work, because we've got a lot of them in place, and, uh, and then making sure that we're requiring those people who are able to work to actually do it. I think that is the only way we're actually going to be able to get our arms around the generational poverty that we have in the state. Mary, do you feel the state and teachers unions restrict local school boards from exercising policies that best fit their local communities? <laughs> <laughs> Just thought that. A resounding yes, maybe? <laughs> and moving in the wrong direction every year for the last eight years. We definitely have to bring our education system into the 21st century and uh, get local comp control back to our school districts and our parents making those choices at that local level. So, yes, yes, yes. I haven't addressed the work requirements, so I want to do that. You know, we really do have a dependency crisis in Minnesota. Do you know that one in five are dependent on Medicaid in Minnesota? And you know how we got here? Dayton expanded the Medicaid under Obamacare. Here's something you may not know. The federal government has been paying us a little bit of that, but at the end of 2019, we're going to be receiving 10% less money towards that program as it grows. So we are at a crisis point. We want to make sure that those who need the benefits get the benefits. And to do that, we need to make sure that those who don't deserve the benefits and don't need the benefits don't get them. So I support a work requirement for able-bodied, but I actually would take it a step further. And I would include an asset test for some of the programs. I don't know if you heard of the, the gentleman that came up and testified in a Republican committee. He was a millionaire. But just to prove his point, he went and applied for food stamps under the SNAP program, and he qualified and he got them. Those are the people that need to be out of the system so that those that need it can get can get the services and programs that they deserve. So I would add the asset test, test to that as well. Thank you. Lance, are you willing to champion the fight to end taxing our senior citizens' social security? And what would you like to do with the extra time? How, how do you know? <laughs> I've been an advocate of that for many, many years. As a matter of fact, uh, there's somebody from Woodbury here, I won't mention his name because maybe he's not my supporter, but I think he's my friend anyway. I've been trying to get, I wrote letters to the editor. My legislator and my senator kind of really didn't agree with me. They said, well, we'll give some relief, but absolutely and unequivocally, no senior in the state of Minnesota should have his or her Social Security tax. My view on that, you're intelligent enough to earn it, you're intelligent enough to spend it. We don't need to have the state collect the money from you and redistribute it to someone who does not want to work. So absolutely and unequivocally, some people say, well, last time 
we gave a little bit of relief to the seniors. It goes a few dollars every year, but we'll take a phase out and then not everyone is gonna be eligible for this. In my opinion, if you're a senior citizen, absolutely, your social security tax should be exempt from any Minnesota state income tax. And it might be a $1 billion charge the first year and thereafter. But where will we find that money? From the waste that goes on in the welfare plan. Mr. Parrish, what can we do to eliminate the disparity between what is being taught versus what's being retained by our students to increase performance, graduation rates, and employment skills in K through 12? All right, 30 years in education and we're still figuring that out, aren't we? <laughs> Uh, I'm actually going to take this question where I think that the core issue is here. The best thing that I've learned as a teacher and, and professional and a principal is the fact that we have direct relationships with students what, at any age. The best places that I've learned from that had a direct relationship with the teacher. I had a strong, decent classroom where I could actually concentrate and focus and learn the information, had somebody that actually mentored and taught the information in a way that was meaningful in one to 10, one to 20, one to 30. Now you're thinking to yourself, there's no school in this state that has a one to 10 ratio, except for maybe a private school. That's gotta make us start thinking about, we have a problem here that we never talk about. And we haven't been talking about it for three or four decades. We keep consolidating schools, and what were you told during the consolidation? Oh, we're gonna help with student teacher ratios. Did it work? No. No, and by the way, and I know, in one minute, I'm gonna go straight into this, the sidebar. I'm gonna follow Reagan's rules, his three laws, right? So I'm gonna get on somebody tonight that was part of this Common Core stuff, part of this federal overtake, part of, the, part of this government overreach, and he isn't here tonight. Now, I don't believe I'm breaking Reagan's rules because I don't believe he's a Republican, right? Tim Plenty's not here to defend himself, but I'm telling you, he's part of this Common Core, this one world order, this globalist agenda. It's gotta be taken on, and we're gonna remove Common Core from our school districts. We're gonna make sure we have teachers in the classroom, and we're gonna make sure our teachers are supported in the classroom. Now, according to the rules, you mentioned his name, so he's got two minutes to rebut. <laughs> I'm not sure if Mr. Peterson saw him. Uh, he hasn't seen him yet, no? All right. If he comes back, we'll let him answer. Uh, Mr. Johnson, do you believe the state of Minnesota is ready in the immediate future to increase its gasoline tax to offset more of the cost of roads and bridges? You're asking some easy questions tonight. No, you can rip on me, but I'm reading <laughs> the question. No, the answer is no. We have plenty of revenue, whether it's through the gas tax or any other. I don't even know where to go with this because there's so many directions, but I'm gonna broaden that to a, a, a question about taxes in general. We don't need to increase any of them. We're in the top eight, I believe, in every single major tax category in Minnesota except for one. And so there are, it's gonna be difficult for any of us as governors to try to choose where we need to cut back most significantly, but for me, it's the income tax. Our highest rate, the one that was created by the Democrats a few years ago, is 85% higher than the national average, which is a huge problem because it drives out investment and wealth. But I think a bigger problem with respect to our income tax is our lowest rate. Because our lowest rate, think about this, our lowest rate is higher than the highest rate in 22 other states. That's insane. So we're not just taxing to death the CEO in Minnesota. We are taxing to death the school teacher and the mechanic and the bartender and the daycare owner and every struggling small business owner in this state. We can actually fix that. And I think that's really important. And then since I have a few seconds left, I just want to tag on to Phil's question about schools. Because I, I think a lot of times we talk about things like mandates, which I think are a huge problem, or how complicated the system is, which I think is a huge problem. But I think the biggest problem we have in our schools right now, at least in the Twin Cities, is the political indoctrination of our kids in the schools that we fund with our money. We need to call it what it is and stop it. Mary, can you describe ways our state can become less dependent on federal subsidies? <laughs> yes, we give it up. <laughs> right? I think sometimes you just have to say no to the federal government. Every time something comes back, and I know this even at a city level, because there have been, if you remember under Obama, there was the revitalization, I don't remember what the dollars were, 
And every time you look at a program, you've got to be able to say, what are the strings that come attached with it? Not only dollar-wise, but future commitment and the paperwork. I'm not kidding, the regulatory environment to comply with it, that you sometimes just have to say no. So that's exactly what I would do with federal, with any, with the federal area. I do want to, since I have extra time, talk about a couple of the school things that came up. One was the school safety and the other was school curriculum or what should be taught. With respect to school safety, the state gives schools hundreds of millions of dollars in their long-term maintenance facility program, but again, it always comes with, you have to use it for this and this. How about the state free that money up? Get that money to the local school districts and let the local school districts decide how and where to use that money for school safety. It's not even new money. It's money that's there that's flowing to them anyway. And if a school chooses locally to have the resource officers, I say continue that program of funding for them. And finally, for me, I also know that for an engagement protocol, we have to have consistency. Because when you have a breach in security at a school and you get city, county, and state, and federal officers there, you have to know what the protocol is to make sure that you have a good result. With respect to, to class curriculum, let's, how about we go back to teaching economically relevant materials? Like exactly like math and reading and get shop back in there and the technology and get those classes back in there. How about we let our teach how about we teach our kids to problem solve and critically think instead of trying to in let the teachers influence how they're going to think. Let's get back to economically relevant education in our school systems so when the, when the kids get out of school, they're prepared. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. It is fairly easy to get questions, and we're getting some sidebar comments and uh, conversations and stuff. If you're if you're not participating, please take your arm out the hallway into one of the rooms. It would be nice for everyone else. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's much All right. Lance, if I could, do you support or oppose expansion of Metro Rail Transit? <laughs> I'm here all week. <laughs> Twice on Saturdays, tip your bars and wait. I'm opposed to it. So that's a simple answer. I'm opposed to it for a variety of reasons. I'm opposed to the fact that it costs so much. And once you pay to ride on it as a fitness compared to what it costs, that's a terrible misuse of the money. I'm opposed to the fact that it imposes restrictions on the use of cars indirectly in the sense that the more area it consumes, there is less area for cars, less area for parking and people will lose their freedoms if they can't drive their own cars. So I'm opposed to that absolutely and unequivocally and allow me to spend a few extra minutes on guns. <laughs> when I was in high school, I took my gun to school. Stayed in the locker all day, went hunting after school. Nobody got shot. Why is that? I think it was the guns. I think it was the people. Pretty clear cut, isn't it? The sad part about that is today in the St. Paul paper, I read that uh, in Ramsey County, last year there were 72 deaths by opioids. That's more deaths than by guns. We don't talk about the opioids. I think a deeper problem is all the discontent and challenges and lack of opportunity that young people do have who are easily seduced and as a consequence addicted to some form of crutch, whether it's alcohol or some type of drug. And that's a path to health. And they don't get back out of it. We need to give them opportunities to work, an opportunity to have a better future, and a better opportunity to have a realistic outlook on life. I think that will reduce the opioids. I think will also reduce the gun deaths. Do you support or oppose state subsidies to wind farm expansion? State subsidies. Wind farms, no, I don't support it, because then here's why. And there's a great piece that I posted today, and I can't take credit for it because the, the Center for the, of the American Experiment uh, did a great piece on it, and uh, Energy Alliance, uh, or Clear Energy Alliance did a great piece on it. So please go to my website, go to the social media page, and make sure you click down, it's a great, it's a great video. And there's a great piece there again by the Center of the American Experiment and Kim Crockett and that crew up there are doing wonderful work telling you the truth about what's actually going on. Because 
we're being exploited and lied to by a set of um, big money spenders and inside deals that is being exposed and that, that piece actually exposes what's going on there. So I really can't say it better than them and I don't want to take credit for their work, so no, I don't support it. Um, and you'll see why in that piece. I'm not gonna go on to anything else. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. What would you do to solve the current MINLARS vehicle registration licensing system? <laughs> I haven't even finished the question <laughs> without adding any cost or burden to the state budget. Well, I would fire a few people, number one. We First, it wasn't so easy as the last one, huh? <laughs> You know, one of the problems, we have a lot of problems in government, and one of them is that no one's ever held accountable for incompetency. And this is a great example, Minsure is a great example, and I could go right on down the list. Um, so, number one, I happen to believe we need a clean house in our state agencies, period. That is a starting point. But then I, I mean, I look at this, and I see it happening again with respect to something that's called the METS system that counties deal with. It's, it's as big a disaster. It's been going on for several years and it's not getting any better. And so other states have apparently been able to figure some of these things out. So maybe we should be talking to them. I, I am guessing that the private sector could probably do it better than government. So that would be the starting point for me. Uh, but I just think holding government accountable is really important and maybe getting rid of some of the people in government who are incompetent would be a, a good starting point. We, we actually getting rid of the most incompetent person in government because Mark Dayton is retired. Yay! And then let me just add to the wind subsidy question, and, and this is subsidies in general, and by the way, I hate to pick on a guy who isn't here, Lance, but since we're both Johnsons, maybe we'll both do it, but those, that, those green energy subsidies, that was championed by our last Republican governor, and it has sent our energy rates skyrocketing in this state, and I'd love to be able to talk to him a little more about that. My problem with these subsidies is that they don't do anything except make politicians feel good. But what, what these subsidies have done is they have hurt people because electricity costs have gone through the roof in the last decade or last eight years in this state. That's, that's hurting normal middle class people and I am just tired of this era of hurting real people to make politicians feel good and this is a great example of that. Mary, do you support or oppose Minnesota or any of its cities designating themselves as sanctuary cities? Oppose. Now, give me, give me easy ones here. Um, I would ban sanctuary cities as governor. And, and to do that, I would ask for a menu of options on what to withhold from cities. So some cities get local government aid, you'd withhold that. Some cities don't get it, so you'd look at other options. You know, you can't let people violate a law. You can't. Think of the Pandora's box that would open for every city to decide they wanted to be a sanctuary something. So absolutely not would ban it in Minnesota. I'm, what should I pick? I'll do energy as well. Um, I believe we should, our policy should be market driven in energy. So I'm not opposed to renewables. I think diversified portfolios and anything are a great thing, but not when the government picks winners and losers. When you try to do that with mandates and subsidies, you get ahead of the market, you destroy innovation, you slow down the economy, and as he said, then prices just go up. We have gone through the prepared questions. What I'd like to do, throw a snowball at you guys quickly, as long as it's snowy out. I'm gonna ask one question, the same question to all of you. Give any extra time you have when you get through with this, please cover anything you want to cover that we've asked so far that you have not. So look at your notes, and then know that you do have your two minutes to end this whole thing. But if I will, Lance, I'll start with you if you would. I think this shouldn't be a shocker question. We get to November 9th, you're the new governor of Minnesota. You get sworn in, what's your first priority? First priority? I'm gonna call my Lieutenant Governor Michelle Elam into the room and introduce her to all of you. <laughs> and then there will be certain people who will be relieved of their responsibilities as department heads. 
quite a few. We will change that culture, and I'll tell the replaced ones or the interims that when you bring your budgets to me this year, you will have a 30% across the board cut in each and every department. And people ask me, why not pick certain ones? I say, I don't have all the answers. You tell me why your department should stay in existence, first of all, and secondly, why should it get a bigger budget? That'll be the quickest way, because if I tell you that you're not gonna get any money this year, I'll guarantee you that you'll go a long ways to try and convince me, yes, you should. That's easier than my saying, well, I'll cut you 5% or I'll cut you 10%, or instead of increasing only 20%, I'll cut you back to 10%. I can guarantee you that if there are across the board proposed budget cuts of 30%, I will get a lot of interesting answers as to why they should be in existence. Secondly, this may surprise you that I'm a lawyer. One of the things I might do is give serious consideration to eliminating the board on judicial standards. It's designed to police judges in fact, I think it covers up for someone more incompetent and evil and should not be judges. We have corruption among some of our judges and I think the best way to start is to eliminate that board. What's the first thing we hear when they say Governor Pierce? I'm gonna attend, after my own swearing in, I'm gonna make sure I attend Doug Wardlow's swearing in to make sure we have an attorney in general that's making sure they follow the law. The second thing I'm going to not do is I'm not going to appoint a single member of the Met Council. <laughs> Some of you know why that's important. Some of you sound like you're not sure why that's important. <laughs> the Met Council's appointed. They're unelected officials that are using taxation authorities that are unconstitutional, and it's going to stop. And we're going to The next thing I'm going to do, and I know you said only one, but I got a nice list, is we're going to make sure we go back to the sanctuary city piece. We cannot, and here, here's where we've had a lot of success with, with my campaign and the, the conversations that we've been having across the state of Minnesota. We can have this conversation about what the, what's been going on with us in here in Minnesota. We can take on this conversation of how badly we've been exploited and manipulated and lied to. We can do it with dignity. We can do it with respect. It's not about race, color, or creed. It's about the law. And we will get to this point where these people, these one world order globalists that live in La La Land and believe that anything goes and anything's fine is not compassion. It's actually harming people. Compassion, compassion without integrity is nothing more than foolish, self-defecation, okay? We have to get back to some integrity and in following the law. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. So I get asked that question all the time. What's the very first thing you'll do as governor? And my answer has always been, number one, I'm gonna go find a quiet place with my family to go pray for some guidance and humility. And then I'm gonna go fire the Met Council and dismantle that beast once and for all. Not because, not because they are the biggest problem in Minnesota, but because they are indicative of the, big, the, the best example of the biggest problem in Minnesota, which is this belief that there are two classes of people in our state. Pretty much everybody in this room, and then what I would call a ruling class who believes it is their job to tell everybody else how to live their lives. And that is where I will start because that it will be in the forefront of my mind every single day as your governor. Governor Stevens has a bit of a ring to it. What do you do? I like that. I like that. Thank you. Well, having gone through this transition, when you take office in January, remember you got elected in November, you've already done 60 days of full-time work to get there. So your cabinet members will be in place. And one of the things I'll tell mine is, just because you were appointed as an agency head doesn't mean you'll keep it because the priorities will be set and one of my priorities is going to be to consolidate water to reduce the regulatory burdens on water we have way too many agencies 
and entities that are involved in water regulation, whether it's businesses, agriculture, our farmers, our, our small entrepreneurs, whether it's the local, it's a watershed district, a lake district, the, the MPCA, the DNR, the Metropolitan Council decided to get into water, uh, the Department of Health is into water. We're gonna save significant dollars and we're gonna help our farmers and businesses by streamlining regulations within water. And we will be ready and set to go when I take office. The other thing is, you have to get a budget out. So you will be working on that during your transition period as well when you're putting your team together so that you're ready to put those numbers together and work with the legislature from the beginning. You don't wait to work with them at the end like Mark Dayton tries to do. You get in there, and because we're gonna have Republican leadership in the House and in the Senate, we're gonna get this stuff done. Thank you. So to wrap it up, we each get our two minutes. I start with you, uh, Lance, if you would. Two minutes, why should anybody vote for you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Plenty trying to interfere again. You know, I thought I felt them underneath here, but I was mistaken. Now they did not come up here, but he went somewhere else. And all these empty chairs next to you? That's Wells Fargo, who you represented. They foreclosed on your neighbor's houses, and they don't have a place to live anymore. And he wants to tell you he's a family man? The foreclosure? The guy that represents the U.S. Bank paid a $712 million laundering bill. Let's, let's say adios to Tim Valenti right here tonight. So I'm a leader. I'm not a follower. Michelle Even is going to be a very, very good lieutenant governor. I'm the first person to pick a running mate on the Republican candidates. I made my position in women very, very clear. Secondly, I support women in two other key respects. I am on record for many, many years that I know that if someone is raped or sexually molested, it affects them for life. It takes a piece of their life. You know, in Dakota County not too long ago, a man was convicted of raping a 15-year-old girl. He went to jail for 150 days. In the Duluth area, somebody raped a five-year-old girl. He went to jail for 100 days. So, in my view, you rape a woman or sexually molest a child and effectively take a life, you go to jail for life. I will not back off that. So this is the year of the woman. You elect your legislators, develop a program, and Lance Justin Johnson, the younger brother of Jeff Johnson, will be your, will be your leader. Okay, I'm going to get away from that. That speaker's driving me nuts over there because it sounds to me like they're like I'm screaming at you and I don't feel good about that. I hope it's okay back there, but um, two minutes to actually convince you. My job right now is to convince you that we can, that I can do this job, that my team can do this job. I was born and raised here with the, after a broken family. My mother worked two, three jobs at a time to make sure we survived. And we went, to, we went to bed hungry more than not for a long time. And that's no disrespect to my father. I'm not going to bore you with my life story. My point is this. She never threw a rock through a window. She never broke, burned a flag. She paid her taxes and she worked her tail off. I want you to think about what you've been training me to do for the last 20 years as a U.S. Navy intelligence officer. You've been training me to, to represent you to protect our Constitution, to defend our laws against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And we have some. Don't let anybody tell you that there's not. Don't let anybody anymore treat you like you're a conspiracy theorist. Don't let anybody anymore treat you like you're a bigot or a racist when you're talking about some simple facts. And those facts are this double standard, this subculture, this parallel culture that is being enabled and assisted is wrong, it's illegal, it's unconstitution and not unconstitutional, and we're going to end it. We are going to end our participation in the immigration and refugee relocation programs. 
We are going to make sure that we get back to following the law. And when what I am offering to you is an opportunity to be, I want to be a leader that you can depend on, and I'm going to bring back the virtues of honor, courage, commitment, integrity, and these things that built America and made them strong. We can do this. We're going to have the most unified convention in June 1st and 2nd than we've had in decades, and I look forward to seeing you at the state convention. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being here. And I, I want to share something that really didn't come up tonight, but everybody sitting up at this table has agreed to abide by our party's endorsement because we believe that's how we're going to win. And I think that's important. And I want to thank you, or many of you at least, for being part of that process and for taking your job seriously as delegates or alternates to the state convention. This election and the next governor changing things, fixing things, it's not about poll tested messaging. It's not about putting on the green eye shades and trying to make our agencies a little more efficient or a little more effective. This is about fundamental generational change to a system that has become arrogant and out of touch and completely broken. Article 1, Section 1 of the Minnesota Constitution says that the purpose of government is the security, benefit, and protection of the people in whom all political power is inherent. All political power is inherent in the people, right at the beginning of our Constitution, and there are too many people in St. Paul right now who don't believe that's true. That is what will drive me every day as your governor, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you. It's our year in Minnesota. It is. It's our year. Much like our country in 2016, 2018 in Minnesota, we are at a crossroads. We have an opportunity with this open seat to take this seat. We have to do it this year. Why me and not the other guys? It's simple math. If you look at the last few elections, Greater Minnesota, you guys have done a great job in working hard and turning your counties red. Thank you for that. And we are going to have to work hard in this election to get the voters out. But I'll tell you, the battle for this state is going to happen and be waged in the suburbs where we are fighting for our political lives. The facts are clear. The last several elections, we have been losing voters in the suburbs. And if we can't pick up suburban voters to offset the DFL advantage in Minneapolis and St. Paul and Duluth, we can't win a statewide election. As a successful mayor, I have consistently won those voters, and I will do it again as your candidate for governor. I'm asking your, for your support, and I will honor the endorsement. Thank you again for coming out this evening. It was a great evening. Thank you. before we go and let Ronald take, will it take over. Um, people don't always know this, and I get to play in a pond with a lot of people in politics, and it's, it's an interesting dynamic when you get more than one in a room at any time, let alone this number. And I had to call them all over in the corner and discuss pulling names and stuff like that. So I'm gonna tell you, this is honest truth. The great group of people here in that no one really cared who got number one, who got number four, no one cared. I asked them, what would you like me to call you? And it was, I want my first name, Lance, and, and, and all the way down, and I'm like, well, that'll be easy, no problem. But I would like to say thank you to you all for coming here. From Little Man, from Blue Earth, Minnesota, I don't get the opportunity to sit and hear each of these governor's candidates tell me what in the world they're going to do for me if you don't come down here. So I thank you for being here. I think the Blue Earth County Republicans for putting this together, I and mean, we also have the CD candidates here. I mean, this has been fantastic. Thank you all for showing up. I'm sure Willow would like to say something before we leave.